Well, good evening and welcome. Um, we're we're going to wait and give a chance for everybody to log in. The the number is climbing. We'll go ahead and take a minute to remind you if you or to tell you some of you have been in one of these sessions before, but if you have questions uh, that you want to ask of Glenn Barber, post them in either the chat or the Q&A option on Zoom, and uh, we will we will get to those after we've been in for a while, and uh, I will read those, uh, I myself or Christian will read those to Glenn um, a little bit later. We usually start at about three or four after, uh, just to give people time to uh, right. log in. Well, that's great, John. I just realized you've had two meetings with Keith today. You're you're doubling down, and uh, and we saw you. Uh, last night too so i mean that's three times in 24 hours <laughs> thank you not yet but don't worry we'll let you know yeah <laughs> um well so, we actually don't get to see your face right now so yeah that's a fair point All right, good evening, everyone. We'll be about two more minutes. Uh, as Keith said in the beginning, well, this is Artist Resource Series number five, actually. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the course of, of the presentation, uh, do put them in either the chat or the Q&A. Uh, Keith synthesizes all those questions. So if we see people that are asking some sort of common threads going through, we uh, will prioritize those and, and get those answered. Uh, some of the materials that Glenn is going to be providing, we will be putting out on our website so people can have access to it. And as always, we are recording these, so it will go up on our YouTube page in the next couple of days. So if you miss something or you're furiously writing down notes and, and you think that you missed something, don't worry, it'll be out for follow-up. Oh, uh, it's louisvillevisualart.org, uh, Claudia. Um, and we have a YouTube page too. I'll go, uh, once I do the introduction, I will go find it and send the link uh, to you. So. You're welcome. Um, all right, well, it is 6.04, so I think I will do sort of a general introduction and, and thank you. And by that time, it'll be about 6.05 and we'll have given people their grace period. Uh, I am Christian Anderson. I'm the executive director of Louisville Visual Art. Uh, with me today is Keith Waits and Glenn Barber. Uh, I want to thank uh, Keith for being the uh, inimitable essence of LVA, having been here for so many years and the anchor of the uh, Louisville arts community. Uh, who is a font of knowledge of all things. So thank you, Keith, for putting all of this together and for everything it is that you do. Um, this uh, series, Artist Resource Series, is something that we came up with last year after listening to artists and saying that they really want some of these, uh, these small sort of professional development uh, courses. We do one a month. The next one is on, did you say February 23rd, Keith? February 23rd. February 23rd, and that's going to be on contracts for artists. So I know this is going to be, this is something that affects a lot of you in filling out contracts and, and what to look for. Uh, so that will be next month's series. 
However, this month uh, is sort of dovetailing off of what we did last year where we did taxes for artists. So uh, the tax season basically starts now and goes for the next couple months. But one of the critical things for taxes is bookkeeping. So here to teach bookkeeping today is Glenn Barber. And Glenn Barber is the CFO of, of LVA and has been for a while and worked with nonprofits and artists as well as in the corporate world. Uh, and um, yeah, sort of our, our financial rock and has probably sent quite a few of you some uh, checks or uh, W-9s over the years. Uh, this, is, this is that guy. So uh, uh, Glenn, uh, take it away. Great, uh, thank you. And I, I should first ask, is my screen being shared? It is, yes. Okay, I don't have the red thing around it. Very good, thank you. Um, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Keith. Excited to be here. I presented uh, in the fall on taxes, and in the middle of that presentation, it occurred to me that um, we really needed to talk a lot about bookkeeping, and uh, and so I suggested we might do another one, and, uh, and here we are, and I'm excited to do this uh, for you. Tonight's, uh, my, my plan, my goal is to spend about 45 minutes going through material uh, and then have questions at the end. The agenda is, uh, is what you see here, basic concepts uh, of what we're going to do. And then uh, why I'm gonna explain why you need to do bookkeeping. Uh, then what are the important components of a really good bookkeeping system? So as you think about how you're gonna go about that, make sure you incorporate these things. I'm gonna provide you with a good old fashioned spreadsheet. And I will tell you, this is actually one I use probably 10 years ago when I did uh, tax returns on the side, I was fully employed and I did tax returns on the side. So for many of you that are just getting started where you only have a few transactions, it's not a lot of activity yet. Uh, that's where I was then. And you'll, you'll see this is a good way to go about that. When we get through that and which is kind of more the do it yourself type portion uh, then we're going to move on to the online options, which are QuickBooks and FreshBooks and some of the others that you've heard about. Uh, hopefully we get finished within the 45 minutes and we have uh, time for questions. The, uh, so the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about the, the basic concepts of what bookkeeping is. And I will tell you, for those of you in the audience, my, the expectation is as a presenter, that most of you are, are not thoroughly entrenched in your bookkeeping situation. Uh, if you are, meaning you're already using QuickBooks or something like that, um, then some of this is gonna be a little remedial for you. But, uh, but when we get to the end, hopefully you'll be a nugget or two that will make this all worthwhile. For those of you who are, are just beginning in your creative business, you're thinking about, okay, I've made a few sales. Maybe I was doing it as a hobby. Maybe I was doing it simply for pure enjoyment. Somebody saw some of my paintings. I sold a few. Next thing you know, I went to an art fair or a neighborhood, whatever. And all of a sudden I've got some activity going here. And now I need to know how to keep up with that. And, and, and the tax, uh, uh, the tax people are coming and here we go. So that's, that's you're the target audience of this evening's uh, webinar. So, the, so we're gonna deal with basic concepts. First one is uh, what, what, why the, the, is the revenues minus the expenses equal net income or unfortunately, occasionally that also equals a net loss. So what we're talking about is how do we account for revenues? What are they? How do we account for them? How do we account for expenses? What are they? And then of course the, the net is simply a, a calculation, a mathematical formula. Uh, there's this concept of cash versus accrual. I don't wanna get into the technical jargon. We're not gonna deal with accrual accounting tonight. We're dealing strictly with cash accounting. All that means is when you receive the money for a sale, that's your revenue, it's a cash revenue. And when you send money out the door, whether it's a uh, check or whatever, that is your cash expense. And so uh, at the most basic level of bookkeeping, it's always we're dealing with cash. You may have also heard the terms single entry bookkeeping and double entry. 
single entry is just cash. It's all we're, we're focused on, revenues and expenses to come up with a net income or a net loss. There are also some concepts of, you know, how, do, how are you going to collect and how are you going to pay? And there's technology that helps you do this. Um, you know, at LVA, we pay a lot of people. So those are people trying to collect from us. We get invoices in the mail. We get uh, emails <laughs> requesting uh, payment. We get uh, notifications from QuickBooks Online where the person that we owe money to has, has sent a notification that way. QuickBooks is going to collect the money from us. We're going to pay them, and then they're going to pay the person that we owe. So there's, there's multiple ways that you can collect money, revenues. And then how you pay, typically you're going to pay with a check or, uh, or some mechanism. It could be Venmo. It could be PayPal. It could be Zelle. It could be all kinds of uh, cryptocurrency, you know, starting to get bigger and bigger. Uh, where you can pay for things with Bitcoin. So um, how you pay and how you collect is all part of the bookkeeping experience. And so uh, there, are, there are websites like billpay.com and, and so forth uh, to help you with that. But we're just going to kind of assume some basic things right now that you write checks, you receive checks, those the checks you write are your expenses, the checks you receive are your revenues, and they go through through the bank. Now I want to begin uh, with the end in mind, as they say. And so what we're going to put up next is a, is a sample income statement, just so you can see this is what after you've done all your bookkeeping, this is what the end result is, and that would be uh, something like this. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger in a second for us to look at the detail, but I wanted you to see the entire uh, statement. This comes from the QuickBooks sample company. When you, when you have QuickBooks, um, you have access to a sample company that QuickBooks prepares so that you can go in and play with it. You can make entries and see what happens, and make sure that, that it does what you want it to so that when you go to your own company and make those entries, you know what they're gonna look like. Uh, this is Larry's Landscaping. Um, this is a profit and loss statement, also called an income statement. Let's make this bigger. So, uh, in, in, in the weird thing about QuickBooks sample companies is they, they go off and they do all the data that in the sample is way in the future. And they do that so that you don't get confused on which company you're working in if you're working in your current company. Here's an example though where, and I'm not gonna get on the detail of these, I'm, I'm high level right now. I'm just showing you what it looks like when you get through the process. There is the income, remember I talked about revenue and then minus expenses, cost of goods sold is a form of expense. And then there are all these other expenses to come up with net income. That's all we're trying to achieve through, through this. Now, what's interesting here is Larry has decided that there are four different categories of income Larry wants to track. And you're going to hear me later talk about categories. So, uh, and then each of the expenses that are important to Larry, uh, typically the ones that have the greatest amount of expenses. So here payroll is very high and rent and Larry has to spend money on tools and some other things. So. Uh, this is this is this is what we're we're trying to get to, and and so that you can give it to people, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, what are the expenses? Well, I begin with they need to be ordinary and necessary. Those are the IRS terms. Uh, to give you an example of ordinary and necessary, if you're a writer and you you know you buy pens. <laughs> Uh, well, those are uh, ordinary expenses and, and necessary expenses. But if you buy a diamond encrusted pen for $3,000, uh, maybe that's not necessary. So those are just, you know, that gives you an illustration on, on what kinds of expenses you're looking for. Because remember, the formula is revenues minus expenses equals the net income. 
So here's some here's some typical artist uh, type expenses. You have office supplies, and you know don't forget studio rental uh, could be home uh, home studio deduction. Um, you know art supplies, um, gallery fees, fees for workshop, um, website design. Uh, all of these kinds of fees, they are ordinary, they're necessary, and you want to make sure you capture them, and that's what bookkeeping helps you do, uh, because you don't want to pay more tax than necessary. So let, let's come to back to, well, why are you doing this? Um, taxes play a big role, but not the only role. I want to be real clear about that, because there's a whole wealth of of value to be gained by doing bookkeeping uh, properly beyond just taxes. But especially as you get bigger, if you don't have other sources of income, this, this creative activity that you're doing is, is a source of income creating profits. You're supposed to be making quarterly estimated payments to the IRS. Well, how do you know where you stand if you haven't been doing bookkeeping all along for all the months? And so, so it's important for capturing your estimated tax liability and then filing the tax return. At the end of the year, you've got to give something. Remember that, that sample income statement here. This is from an accountant's perspective. This is great. Larry gives this to the CPA. CPA puts it into the tax return. I mean, this is solid. This is gold, and 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 so, uh, so that's why you're doing it. You pay. You're going to pay less uh, for the tax return if you help the the CPA or the enrolled agent or the who, whoever the preparer is. If you help them to to be efficient. Okay, here's another here's another great uh, reason. It tells you where where your money is going. You know, I'm I'm doing a lot with clients right now where we've been doing monthly uh, financial statements. We've gotten to the year end of the year. We've made the adjustments, and now I put 12 months of statements, uh, like you just saw with Larry there. But it's but it's monthly, and you get to see a trend. And so you can see, okay, wow, I'm spending a lot on this. I didn't realize that this may be technology. It may be rent, it may be supplies, it may be, you know, insurance, I mean, maybe telephone, internet, who knows, but you, by doing it this way, you get to see where your money's going and make better business decisions, and, and the trends are important. You'll see your revenue trends going up or down. You'll see seasonality that may or may not be there. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to make better business decisions for your creative business, uh, by having uh, the, the proper bookkeeping system and tool available to you. And then as you grow, if you need to borrow money, the bank is going to absolutely require that you have some kind of financial statement, both historical and then also to project forward. And when we get to the little one I have, you'll find it'll be easy for you to create a projection if you want to do that. Uh, and then finally, and this is this is something that I stressed in the tax seminar that we had back in the fall, it, by doing proper bookkeeping, it is one of the 10 to 13, I can't remember exactly how many there are, uh, items that the IRS looks at to decide whether or not you are a business or you are a hobby. And so, uh, and the reason that's important is if you make a profit as a hobby, you, you have to pay tax, and that's no different than if you make a profit as a business. But if you have a net loss uh, in a business, you get to offset that against other income. And so, so I think for one, and one of the requirements for demonstrating you're in business is to have proper bookkeeping procedures. And so, because when you're, if you're a hobby, you don't, you don't keep up with that stuff. You're doing it as a hobby, but if it's a business, you are. So these are the reasons why you really, you really want to do it. Well, let's talk about kind of what the, what the most important components of a really proper bookkeeping system are. Uh, and, and number one, if you take nothing else away from this webinar, except for this, 
It is separate your business and personal activity, your checks, your expenses. So in the best way to do that is to get a separate checking account at the bank. Now, if you're a sole proprietor, you sell people, you know, you don't have really have a business name, you can just get two personal accounts. It doesn't have to be a quote business account at the bank, but you you call it your business account. And so you write checks from there. Highly recommend if you write checks, just go ahead and spend a few extra dollars and get the carbon copy checks so that when you write it and give it away, you've got a record right there. That works when you don't have a lot of transactions. If you have a lot, you don't need that. You need a better bookkeeping system uh, like the online options, QuickBooks and so forth that we'll talk about later. But until you get to that point, uh, just having two separate checking accounts, a debit card uh, for your, your you know, spending needs when you're out and you need a card to do it, uh, or even a credit card, just having a different credit card for what you do just for business. Okay, I, I, I beat that one, but again, if you get nothing else from this seminar, get that. If you're not doing it, January is a great time to start that. Uh, so the second thing is you want to implement a good system. Uh, and that's what we're talking about tonight. The third thing here is I really want to categorize transactions. We got a little bit of that concept when we saw uh, Larry's landscaping income statement. Uh, Larry categorized some revenues, um, and then he also categorized expenses. When you file your tax return, whether you're doing it individually on what they call Schedule C, which is for sole proprietors, um, you can't just say, well, I had one big bucket of revenue and I had one big bucket of expenses and here was the net. The IRS doesn't like that at all. They want you to categorize your expenses. And so we'll talk about what those categories are, but they're basic rent, technology, uh, you know, education, supplies, office, administration, selling, so forth. Uh, the other thing that's a really important component of a bookkeeping a properly executed bookkeeping system is how you store information. And of course we store a lot digitally today. We get a lot digitally um, and, and, and that's great. You can store it that way, but you're also gonna be touching paper. You know, you're gonna be somewhere at, 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 in a retailer, they're gonna give you a piece of paper. You're gonna get something in the mail, whatever. And I highly recommend that you, you have an accordion file, you, you do it by month or you do it by vendor, uh, or you do, it, you do it in some organized fashion where you keep up with those pieces of paper, where you marry the, the receipt with what it is for. And so you write on the receipt, paid with check number so-and-so, or you write with, you know, met, you know, met, whoever for, you know, for lunch or selling expense or whatever, whatever it is, you want to keep that. And I will tell you, you know, we typically for clients, we scan uh, any big piece of paper, but for receipts, I don't do that. You'll see why in a minute. We just put them in, a, in an envelope um, and keep up with it. I have the front of the envelope is the oldest, the back of the envelope is the newest. One goes in, I put it in the back. And then you have that for the year. Now, for some clients, we might wait till the end of the year and scan all those receipts, but really uh, receipts don't take up a lot of space when you talk about quote being paperless. And then the final thing is, you know, make it a habit, make it a habit to go through this. That's, uh, that's really important. What I, what I thought I'd do is we're talking about revenues and expenses. I've shown you some expenses. I wanna talk about invoicing real quick. This is something, especially for new artists, new vendors, new people that are in business that LVA uh, is paying. Uh, I get a lot of invoices that are, they just, they don't meet, they don't, uh, they don't get, they don't have what they need to have for me to get them paid. And so what you want to do is make sure, make sure that you, uh, uh, properly present an invoice to somebody that you want to be paid. I'm going to blow this up again in just a moment, but standing back, I just want you to get a sense where you have, you know, you have your company name, who it's to, 
where you're shipping, all of this. There's a description, a total due, and so forth. So let's blow it up a little bit and look at the anatomy of this invoice. Um, so this is, and by the way, I, I, I meant to mention this in the beginning of the presentation. Uh, this spreadsheet is available. Christian did mention it, but uh, anybody who wants to email me at Glenn, that's G-L-E-N-N, -N, at louisvillevisualart.org, uh, I will send this to you. You will have not only these slides, but you'll see in a moment, you're gonna have some templates for your own bookkeeping system. But when you send an invoice to somebody, I love it when I get the company name. Hey, and guess what? <laughs> put the put your address because I get invoices sometimes that say, in effect, pay me, and I, well, I don't know how to pay you. I don't know where to send it. Um, and so that's really important. Love an invoice number. Love an invoice number uh, because uh, when somebody's paying you, they want to reference that because they're matching an invoice on their end with the check that they're paying you. Of course, you have a due date. Uh, you know, this is this is your information. Might put your website there if you have it. Uh, this is who you're invoicing, who owes you the money. Uh, you may or may not have a ship to, uh, and, and sometimes it may be different. Uh, here's some, I like this, just some comments. You can say something on your, on your invoice. Um, this is stuff that doesn't have to be in here, but you know who at the company requisitioned it or who, and that would be at the per, at, at, at who you're sending the invoice to or who at your company sold it, or maybe there was a purchase order. That's high level stuff, but this is all good. How it was shipped, uh, that's freight on board, almost doesn't occur anymore. But let's talk about terms. Terms are really, most receipts, or excuse me, most invoices will, are today generally say due on receipt, but you still have a fair amount that say net 30. All that means is, is that they want you to pay the amount due within 30 days. That's, so that's what net 30, and sometimes it's net 10 and net 15. And that's all it means is you pay those amounts by those times. Now, occasionally you'll see a percentage in days. And what this means is that if you pay the invoice within 15 days, you can deduct 2% off of the invoice, and, and which is a great deal. Uh, you hardly ever see this anymore. It's almost always due on receipt uh, because, it, you know, in today's world, we're all just fast at everything we do. And there's uh, nobody wants to give up 2%. Uh, you're going to list your items, quantity, description, you know, unit price. You can play around with this. Don't forget the sales tax. If you're selling something, uh, you'll, you're, you're going to want to collect the sales tax because you're going to have to remit that. Uh, in Kentucky, shipping and handling is now taxed as it is in most places, but, uh, but you'll figure out what the right, uh, you would put shipping here and then you would have a subtotal tax and then the total due. Here's, here's a great one. Tell them who to make the check payable to and then how they can get in touch with you if they have a, a question, because you want to make sure that you don't have a, um, you don't have an issue with not getting paid. It sounds simple, but you'd be amazed that, that especially folks that are beginning. So get this part right, you'll, you'll really look professional. Now we're gonna move to, well, what, what is it? Okay, we looked at, at Larry's landscaping. Now let's look at Glenn Barber's 10 year old spreadsheet. Uh, for doing tax returns on the side. And I'm actually going to show you when we go to this tab, you're going to actually see the data. They changed the names to protect the innocent, as they say, and re respect confidentiality. But, and I, then I changed some of these over here. I was, I had, uh, you know, tax practice software and some other things, but I, I, I just renamed these a little bit for you to see. But essentially this is, you, you come in for the month, you, you spend $25.63 on something and you just put it in here. Then you put the receipt in a, um, 
in, in an envelope and you're done. You, you are literally you know, uh, finished for that piece of it. A lot of times you'll, you know, you're know you gonna categorize, these are the categories we were talking about it, where you're gonna lump ex expenses together. Let's say you have three expenses in that time period. And, and so in, a, in Excel, you just put your equal and then you have that plus we'll say $15 plus you know, $12 and 34 cents. And then they all add up to this amount. And so it's just a really easy way. And so for the month of February, we had $52.97 in expenses. Uh, here, maybe you have, you have some sales. We'll say we sold something for $1,500. Now, all of a sudden for that month, we have net income. We have the same thing going on for the year here. And so let's say in June, we sell, uh, we sell some more art or whatever. And in July, we teach a little class and we have some money. And then we, we uh, signed up for Adobe or whatever. And so we have $280 in expenses there. And you can see it, it just begins to, so for the year so far, we have $4,500 in income and then we have some expenses. So now this is uh, this is so simple and easy, but you but it's it's pretty powerful uh, because you'll be able to see trend analysis, you'll be able to see monthly how your expenses are going and so forth. And this is primarily if you have you know five, 10, you know maybe 15 transactions a month. If you have more than that, this becomes harder to manage because you you have you, it's just you, you have to do a lot of entry and so forth well this is one this literally is the last one i did a long time ago uh what i did up here was i now i i had the client name and i had the dollar amounts that they paid me the i did that same thing there where i entered them all so for that given month in april i made the that amount of deposits i'll tell you i added the last names of people at LBA here. So uh, they did not do these things, but, um, and then you know, Rembrandt and Dutch Masters, Monet and good old Bob Ross and so forth. Um, but this is where uh, in, in, in back to, so in this example, we, we could see seasonality. If you remember, I was doing tax returns. So naturally April, May and June were big collection months, but guess what? Those who waited till October and September were also um, pretty big months there. So you begin, you can see in your business how, how the trends are going. Here we have some expenses. Some of these I, I had to rename, you know, obviously I didn't have art supplies. I had some other kind of expense, but again, you, you get back to uh, here were a bunch of little expenses I had for that particular month. They added up to that amount. Now, here's a little trick I did on the bottom because remember how I told you to separate your uh, personal and your business expenses? And I, while I did that, I did have a separate uh, business bank account. The checks were written to me personally. And if I was already at the bank, remember this is 10 years ago, so we didn't take pictures of checks on our phones. Uh, if I was at the bank, I went ahead and just put it in the in into the account where I banked. Uh, and so I went ahead and did this down here just as a note to myself. Hey, you know, these two I put in, uh, I put in, and like this month I did one in one account and one in another. And then over here to the side, you can like this entry right here is a telephone expense. It's the end of the year. I, re I recognized that my cell phone was needed to talk to all of these clients so they could reach me. So that was an ordinary and necessary business expense. But my entire cell phone bill, I also used it personally. So um, I did 12 months at, at $20 a month and I just put it in there. And so again, I didn't miss an, an expense because I was paying attention to my bookkeeping uh, activity. And then down here, I could have put in what the expense was. You know, if that $100 could have been, you know, Preston Art Supply and just put it in there and, and, and go. All those are to remind me. 
So this is this is a this is simple. It's a simple system. It works. Uh, gives you great information. You can actually just print this page, give it to your tax preparer, and they will look at this the same way they look at this good one from Larry's Landscaping because all they're going to do is they're going to focus on this column right here. They're not going to worry too much about that, although if they're good, they'll take a quick look at it and say, hmm, I probably should ask them why they have these two big expenses, no other expenses, just to you know, make sure they're aware of something. And, and then they'll put in the revenue here, they'll put those in, and then the net will be what is uh, used for the tax. So this is, let's say you have more transactions. All of a sudden you have 80 transactions in a month. Uh, you, you can't do this. This doesn't work for that. So what I do, I do this for all of my clients right now. I start with, and, and, and typically this is with a charge card, but it could also be with a bank, uh, bank statement. Uh, I, I start with a template. I copy the template. Then I rename it. for the month and the period that it is, and now I'm good to go. And what I do is I start right here, and, and this is a neat little trick. It, it works out really well. When you get, so I, I've got one client, they have a, ch a, a chase statement. It's this long thing. The, there's three columns. The left column is the date. The middle column is the activity, UPS bills, Starbucks, whatever. And then the right column is the dollar amount. And I start, Start with the right column, and I'm going to do it right now like I do uh, to show you um, a few things. Um, I just start putting in the amounts like this, and then I, I go through, if you'll bear with me, it takes about a minute. I'll get these in. I'm going to show you some nice things to deal with. Okay, so what I've done here is um, I'm not looking at the statement. I'm only looking at the dollar amounts and I'm quickly putting it in just like I did right there. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the statement itself and I'm gonna grab these expenses and I'm gonna put them in a category. So let's say that was interest and that was, let's say that was a bank charge and that was um, you know, a meal and an entertainment and Let's say that was, you know, maybe rent. Uh, this one I know for this particular is always storage. They have a storage facility um, and, and, and dues. And then sometimes you can even grab some of them if they're all together. So maybe those are like office expenses. And, and then you may find out, out where you wanna put one over here in unassigned because it doesn't fit one of these categories. And so what I do then is I just put like, maybe it's marketing or something. And that's just a reminder to myself when I make a journal entry that I'm, uh, that I'm going to do that. And so, uh, and, and, and so the other thing I do is I come down here, these are just totals and they come all the way back up. I plug in what the what the credit card company says the charges were, and then and I'm subtracting and I want that to be zero. And this is why this is important. Let's say that I transposed these numbers and did fifteen five six instead of fifteen six five. Well, this is going to tell me I'm out right now. Oh, and guess what? There's a little trick. Any, any difference that is exactly divisible by nine, it means that you've transposed a number. So that's a, 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 that's a wonderful little trick when you're out of balance, you always divide by nine first. If it's exactly even, you know you're looking for a number that you transpose. So instead of 1556, it was 1565. And now we're back 
to good. So I know I'm good. And so now I've got these entries. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you um, what this looks like when you've done a, a bunch. And here's, here's, here's a client, a client I've got that uh, we do. They, they sell a product, they do a lot of shipping. They've got uh, these kinds of expenses. They come across to the top up here. There was one unassigned. They, did, they paid a consultant to come in and do some work with them. And so this, but as you can see, it comes all the way down. This particular month, they had about 80 transactions. I've had where they have, they have three people who have credit cards in this company. So uh, they get a lot of transactions. Um, and, and so what happens here is now you're gonna put it, you're using QuickBooks or some accounting system if, if you're at this point. And so what we do, and here's a copy, this is a, a snip of the journal entry in their accounting system. This is the money that is owed to Chase, okay? And, and back to, that was this number right here. It was the purchases. And then, so for instance, you had uh, office was 1623.97 and somewhere there's, yeah, here's your office expense. And so all this is doing is it's putting the expenses in the accounting system. It's saying that you owe Chase. And then when we write a check to Chase, it'll clear that out and say, you don't owe them any more money. So that's kind of, um, a more sophisticated, higher volume way. Um, I'm gonna show you something you could do right now that's kind of slick. If you, if you do this high volume, okay, which means you have a lot of activity, but if you went ahead and set up one for every month of the year, and then you had activity, you could, uh, you could actually bring them into, into an income statement. This kind of looks like the one I had before. But if we remember, I'm allocating these expenses. Oops. Look, I know I'm doing a bunch of weeds here. And I know this is, but, but if, you, if you need a system, this is really a good way to do it and without having to spend any, any money. Uh, and then what happens here is now those show up in January and you can, if you do that throughout, then all you have to do is each, each month you would, you know, pull these over and now you would have your expenses and you would have your income statement and you would have each month's activity. And then you would see the trends in each month. So these are, these are the, 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 the ways that you, that you can do it yourself. Now I wanna jump over to uh, online options. Uh, this is QuickBooks mostly. That's what most, you know, they're the standard. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're also can be frustrating and, and, and expensive. Uh, but uh, here are, I found this on the internet. I thought, I thought this was accurate. Uh, these other items, FreshBooks, Wave, uh, Sage is, is, used to be called Peachtree, so they're as old as QuickBooks. Uh, I don't know anything about Account Edge Pro and I didn't look at it, mostly because it says it's best for desktop users. And I think most of you are, are not going to be downloading, you know, you're, you, you're not going to be going with the full-blown accounting software needs. Uh, I will tell you, Cashew and Wave and FreshBooks are, in my opinion, really good uh, things to look at, and we're going to jump over to them in just a moment. Uh, Zero is is highly integrated with a lot of apps, um, and Zoho is part of a big customer relationship management company, payroll, all kinds of things. It's too big for if you're looking at starting bookkeeping. It's just uh, too big. So what I want to do right now is jump over to uh, to the QuickBooks, and um, and so uh, QuickBooks starts out, and they will. I love the way they market. They are they are master marketers. Um, they're going to tell you this is the most popular. 
and that you really need all these items. But the fact of the matter is, all you need is this one right here. You want to track income and expenses. You want to invoice and accept payments. And, 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 and really, you want to run some general reports. There's not a lot more that you want to do in QuickBooks. So if you, if you sign up for QuickBooks, do the simple start. Um, and now it's one company, and this is QuickBooks Online. Um, and now if you have a bunch of users, uh, you, you may want to step up, but and a user doesn't mean only one person. It just means one person on there at a time. So two people can share the same uh, one user um, with QuickBooks. Here's FreshBooks. Um, and, and so they've got, now FreshBooks is interesting. They're a lot less, they're their lowest part, but you can only bill five, cli five clients. So uh, only five customers at a time, that's no good. If you have 50 customers or less, then this might work pretty good, um, but you can track expenses and, and revenues and so forth. And so, I. You know, I don't know. FreshBooks is kind of interesting, um, and uh, but it's you know it is something there. Uh, Wave is free. Hey, hey, free, always free. Uh, and and they you track you you can track income and expenses. So how do they make their money? Well, they're hoping you're going to send an invoice electronically to somebody. That person is going to pay with a credit card. And they're going to deduct this from what you're owed, uh, and uh, and and then give you the money. And so that's how they'll make their money. And they also offer payroll and and some other uh, other items. Uh, Cashew used to be really inexpensive, kind of cool. Um, it you know it's it's not quite what it used to be. Uh, they're not doing the expenses on the free version. But you can send invoices and accept payments. They'll make money the same way. They're going to charge a fee, a processing fee. <coughs> um, then if you want to expand, you're, you're, you're looking into essentially the same expenses as QuickBooks. Um, so these are, these are areas that uh, uh, are companies that you can use for online bookkeeping if you decide not to go the do-it-yourself route. Um, so Keith, I want to open it up right now uh, for any questions that we may have had and, um, and, and see where we might be. All right, and uh, so I'll come back in here and I, there's Christian too. Um, you know, there were, a, there were a couple of questions I think that sort of uh, hinged on this moving from hobby to business, like for, for example, um, uh, Amanda asks in the chat, what happens if I needed to do some necessary payments for my personal account before I was able to get a business account? Oh, that's a great question. So, uh, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to address it the same way I did back when I did things. I was, I, I, I did have activity Amanda, what you want to do is just keep up with it. Just keep up with it. If you had personal expenses, excuse me, you had business expenses out of your personal account, well, you'll just make sure you you capture it. And, and that's why you want to do it monthly. You don't want to forget and, and, and not remember and then try and go back and look through your personal checking and all the uh, activities. But yes, they are deductible regardless of which account they came out of purpose of bookkeeping is to help you not miss that deduction. Okay. And there's a couple of questions that have to do with uh, length of time or, or business activity over time. Uh, the first one is how many years are allowed for a sole proprietor business to have more expenses than income and be able to write <laughs> off the expenses before the government shuts the business down? And would that be the federal, state, or local government? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, there, well, so first off, the business itself is recognized by the state as a legal entity. And so you you register with the state and, and the state doesn't care about the IRS and whether you make money or not. 
in terms of, of your entity. So they'll never shut you down for that. Now the IRS cares how the entity de decides to be taxed. So back to the, so the question was how many years can you have losses before you're not really recognized as a business? Th there's 10 or 13 different things. One of them is you have to intend to make a profit. Uh, one of them is, is if you've had three of the last five years, you've had a profit, then that indicates that, you know, you intended to make a profit. You don't, you can have five straight years of losses in the sixth year, have another loss and claim it. If you meet all the other requirements, um, you have to meet more of them if you have that situation. Um, you have to act like a business, which means you have to keep contemporaneous records. You have to have good bookkeeping systems like you have here. You have to have expertise in the field. Um, you have to, um, um, you have to uh, you know, go out and market. You have to behave like you would if you were in business. And then also inherent in there is if you have certain expenses that are the same expenses, over five years that are causing loss and they're not producing revenue, then a business person would stop those expenses. And so if you don't do that, then you don't look like a business. So it, but generally speaking, clearly three years of profits out of five gets you a little bit of a safe harbor. Um, and, but the main thing is that they think you intend to make a profit and then, and then pay tax. Um. So there's a, between the chats and the Q&A, there's a question I, on collecting sales tax. And so uh, one of them was, um, if you're selling to a nonprofit, do you have to collect sales tax? But another uh, was, if there is a gallery as an intermediary who's collecting sales tax, do you have to worry about that? So for people who, whether they're hobbyists or whether they're a business, let's, how does the collection and reporting of sales tax? Oh, that's a great question. So if, if you are selling, so, so sales tax has to be collected by who is called a retailer. And a retailer is somebody who sells to the end user and they have to collect sales tax. So let's go to the gallery example. In, in that example, uh, the gallery would collect the tax and they would remit the tax to the state and then remit payment to you. And then you would have uh, an exemption on your, you, you would still file a sales tax return, by the way, but, but the, you, and you would recognize the sale, but it would be exempted be, because it would be a resale type certificate. And so all that means is, is that, that, in other words, there's not, the, the state doesn't get sales tax twice. And so because there's a resale involved, you know, in theory, you sold it to the gallery, then the gallery sold it to the, uh, to the end user, then, then, the, then there was a resale certificate where you don't pay the tax, it's whoever collects the tax pays it. Now it could be different, maybe you did it on consignment. And, and so the, the gallery is simply collecting the money and then giving it all to you. And in that case, uh, of course, taking their cut. Um, but in that case, they should be collecting the sales tax, remitting the full sales tax to you. And then you do file a sales tax return with that amount. And then what they're going to do is they're going to have a resale certificate on the, because now they're the ones who are just the pass through entity. It's whoever collects the tax from the end user is the one who remits it to the state. Um, there's also, let's see, there's, uh, uh, how do you, how do you categorize model fees when reporting taxes? I know this is not the tax uh, webinar, but, uh, what's. Yeah. And can I, can I summarize this with a couple others? There's a couple different things about categorizing particular fees and, um, I'm going to sort of phrase it as in what I understand and tell me if I'm wrong, Glenn, like there is no singular expense that has to be categorized in a particular way. There are some that are more obvious, like rent being rent. But as long as there is a consistency in categorizing it the same way month after month, so you're showing you're doing the same thing, especially if something might be marketing, but it might be 
a, a fee, it could go either way. It, 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 the, the IRS isn't going to mad get super mad about which category you put it in as long as you do it consistently. Is that a fair statement? That's that's a fair statement. It brings joy when my executive director understands these things. <laughs> uh, there are a few, though, that you do have to be like wages. Uh, they do prescribe how that's done, a retirement account, contributions, and a few others. But but th but your statement is 98% accurate for the activity that, that is going to be occurring. Well, and there's a question about, uh, and if I understand this correctly, I think they're asking if they file as a small business in one state and then have to move to another state, uh, do they have to refile in that new state? Okay, so um, th this is where it gets really interesting. You can you can still remain a business in the old state, but you have to, if you're having activity, so here's how it works. You are domiciled in a state, and that's what the Secretary of State is not the Department of Revenue, and it's not the IRS. It's the Secretary of State. And so, for instance, if you are a Kentucky business registered with a Kentucky Secretary of State, you move across the river into Indiana, you have two choices. You can remain a Kentucky business, and then you file with the Indiana Secretary of State as a foreign entity. And it sounds like it's from outside the country, but it just means from a different state. Uh, or you could uh, dissolve your Kentucky entity and establish yourself in Indiana as an Indiana entity, but that is changing the company. And so uh, it gets a little bit tricky. Uh, if, if I were moving to a new state, I would just dissolve it with, with Kentucky and set it up with the new state I'm going to. Okay, and there was a question about the spreadsheets that you are using here. And so those are going, you mentioned at the top about providing those as uh, as resources. Yes, yes. So, and actually this is one spreadsheet, LVA bookkeeping presentation. Uh, I can, and, and, and of course there's nothing uh, confidential or sensitive here. Uh, so if somebody wants to email me, Glenn, at louisvillevisualart.org. I will uh, send it back to them as an attachment. Uh, they can get rid of whatever <laughs> tabs they want. Uh, this is this is the nice one though here. This is, you know, this is so easy. It's so easy. Back to what I did. I mean, I would just put in, I would get the bank statement out from this business account. And then I would remind myself if there was anything I did personally and then just pop them in here. And when I did my schedule C, that was my top number. These are my expenses and that was it. And paid my tax on that and moved on. Okay, and that's Glenn, G-L-E-N-N. -N, so everybody knows you gotta have two, the two ends. Ends at louisvillevisualart.org. You know, yes. Glenn, I'm, what, when we asked about the sales tax, I realized that I don't know that we specifically answered Elmer Lucille's question about if you're selling to a nonprofit, Oh, thank is you. Sales, is there sales tax collected? Great question, Elmer Lucille. Um, the no, uh, nonprofit entities do not have to pay sales tax, but they do have to provide to the to the seller what's called an exemption certificate, and and which means they it's a form the state in Kentucky the state has, and and they get an exemption number from the state. Uh, I can't remember what ours is at LVA, but and 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 so so then you don't have to collect sales tax and you don't have to remit of course sales tax. You do have to record the sale on your sales tax return. You just you you deduct it and it's is and you list an exemption. And they have a code. I think it's one seventy or one eighty or something like that. Uh, but no, that's a good question. Nonprofits do not have to pay sales tax. Um, I think that that covers the gist of most of them. If there are any, well, I mean, I know we had a handful of questions both in the Q&A and in the chat. If you have another one that we missed or, or you don't feel like you've got a satisfactory answer, um, shoot it out to us again right now. Um, I put Glenn's email address in the chat. Um, oh, great, and so, thanks. 
And the YouTube link is up at the top of the chat too. I should probably can go find that again. Uh, so you can link back and look at um, taxes for artists, which was uh, we did in September. Oh, phone fee. Uh, so that was a question. So you said you were deducting, uh, 20, um, you were deducting, uh, $20 a month for your phone. How did you come across what was a fair percentage for your cell phone bill deduction? Whenever I thought I'd get away with it and on it. Um, it's, I'm going to tell you, so most small business people, they just, they don't do what I did. They, they put the full bill in there that, you know, there's four lines, their spouse, their children, um, they, they just put it in there. And, uh, but as a CPA, I'm kind of held to a higher standard. So I had to really do what I thought was a, appropriate. I, you know, I, I said that in jest in the beginning, what I really did was I thought what was appropriate. I think it's a, was a $40 bill and I, I took half or something. Um, and so there's a there's a technical question about are the spreadsheets to be done in Excel? I mean, you're currently using Excel, but if uh, if there is a, a CSV file or Excel can open up on Google Sheets, if you if you use Google Sheets, you can open it up on Google Sheets. Um, I don't find that they convert very well with numbers, which is sort of the Mac native one. But Google Sheets is pretty interchangeable with Excel. I'm um, glad you brought that up. Yeah, it, it, generally it is. And, and this could be saved as both both an Excel workbook and as a CVS, uh, or as CESD, I think, yeah. Or CVS if you want some groceries. Yeah. Uh, um, well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Um, and thanks everyone for attending. The next session again is going to be on contracts. So uh, we can help artists navigate contracts, the, the do's and don'ts. Uh, I want to thank Brooke Smith for sort of believing this and underwriting these series and their good partnership with the Great Meadows Foundation as well. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, thank you, Glenn. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And hopefully, uh, we will see you in February to talk contracts um, from all of us here at LVA. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>